Hey everybody, welcome back. In this episode of Practical Robotics, I want to talk to you about making sense of sensor data sheets. The information in this video usually is going to relate to uh, an I-square seed communication device, uh, that we're, where we tend to read and write to specific registers. Sometimes a serial device uh, will be configured in a similar fashion. The data sheet will be laid out similarly, and the information here will be useful for those as well. Specifically today, we're going to look at the LSM303 DLHC accelerometer and magnetometer. The first thing to look at in any data sheet, of course, is the front page with some significant information. The very first thing you need to take note of is that you're looking at the correct device. Well, this is an LSM303. It happens to be a DLHC module, and there are other modules available that are LSM303 with a different suffix. Devices with the same prefix but a different suffix are often have enough differences that you really need to look at the correct data sheet or the module that you're working with. This is the very module we used in practical robotics in C++ for some of the tutorials and we have some code written for. And we actually use it in the example robot build in that book. Now that we're looking at the correct module, some of the other important things to look at, starting in the features, are just the overview. This module has three channels for the magnetic field and three channels for acceleration data. The features provide the scale, and what's important to note is that there are varying scales, so we know that there's going to be a configuration item to set down the line somewhere. So we're going to have to keep our eye out for that as we're looking through all the registers and the configuration options. 16-bit data output is a very important thing. That means we have to read two bytes of eight bits each and combine them to get one piece of information. And this module is uses an I squared C serial interface. Uh, for this tutorial, I'm going to assume you know basically how to read and write with I squared C that you're able to use the interface correctly. Uh, I cover that in Practical Robotics in C++ in Chapter 5, which is communications with sensors and other devices. Uh, so I'm going to assume that you have the basics of I squared C communications and how to do it. Uh, this tutorial is more about learning what to communicate. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through every single feature as you can read and it's going to vary for every device and you'll just need to pay attention. I know reading data sheets from top to bottom can be pretty tedious and it just seems like a lot of information that's impossible to understand at first um, or at least you don't want to but it's pretty important there's enough little tidbits buried in all the different pages that you really need to go over uh, your data sheet for your device uh, fairly thoroughly all right the next thing i wanted to talk about is here on page eight uh, the pin description more than the pin description because usually when we use these modules, we're not getting a bare chip. Uh, at least I don't do that. Some of you might, and my hat's off to you. I don't like to solder that small. And I prefer to acquire one that is already on a board, like this one from Adafruit. But the thing to note is this device has this little dot, right? This is the main chip. And it has this little dot. And that is going to relate to the little dot on this pin description drawing. And this is how we know what our axes are, right? When we're talking about the data we're getting for the X axes in acceleration, for instance, it's going to be coming in this direction. And the Y is uh, perpendicular, like an XY grid. And then Z is usually our vertical axis of data. Um, it's important to pay attention because once in a while you'll find a sensor where the Z arrow points down um, so it's good to have these and know where that dot is in relation to each of these axes. We're going to come back to sensor characteristics. These are important uh, to note when you're setting other things and reading in a little while, and we'll come back to that. Scattered throughout data sheets is going to be important information about how the device calculates the numbers that it's going to give you. So if you skip reading these, you may expect the device to give you one reading and then it is offset uh, or otherwise incorrect from what you're expecting. And these can be a great clue for why, if you were reading a device, that it's not reading 
uh, an expected number. For instance, an accelerometer should read 1g of gravity when it's stationary because of the pull of gravity. This section, 2.62, explains why there's going to be a little bit of offset between mounting and just individual characteristics from the manufacturing process. Every device is going to be off a little bit from a perfect reading. So these little tidbits can help you account for those in your software. Other things that are important to notice are if most devices have different modes, it's important to read what mode does what. Here's the section about electrical connections. If you heard the chip is put onto a, a board for you, most of these components are usually taken care of. The application hence also has important information such as warning about your wiring and how that can cause error in reading the magnetic field. Fortunately, we use libraries and we can usually skip the nuts and bolts of I squared C to communication and just call on our library functions. All right, getting past the generic I squared C information, we're going to get into the individual devices. Now the LSM303 is an accelerometer and a magnetometer, but just because they're on one chip, they are two separate I squared C devices with two separate addresses. The accelerometer uses this, uh, they have it written in binary here, 0011001 in binary, and that works out to if uh, a hexadecimal address, and usually our addresses are in hexadecimal, so 0x19. If we come a little further, we can see that the magnetometer's address is a little bit different, and this binary works out to 0x1e. Um, so if you do a search for I squared C devices when you plug this in, you should see both of those addresses. Okay, this is where we're getting into the good stuff that I really want to spend most of this video on. And this is the register mapping. A lot of sensors, um, you directly access registers, and the registers are either for control, configuration, or data. And every register holds one byte of information. And of course, every byte holds eight bits of data. This register address map is kind of a quick overview and it's a handy guide once you generally know what each of these things are. And then you're just trying to remember, oh, what was that register number? Uh, what was the default value of a certain register? Little hints that they don't necessarily spell out, but you get kind of used to looking for is because this has an accelerometer and a magnetometer, you might be able to figure out looking at this register address map that this underscore a suffix all of these means that it pertains to the accelerometer and registers that end with the underscore M uh, pertain to the magnetometer. Is a register readable or writable? And that's what these stand for. R it means you can read only from the register. RW means you can read or write. So for example, our control register 1A, we can read and write to. So when we boot up the device, we could read this register 20. Well, that's hex 20. Don't confuse that with decimal. And we should be able to read this default value of 0000111. Because it's a writable register, we should be able to change this. And we will do that later to configure some, some options. Uh, down here, this is an output register. This happens to be part of our X data for acceleration. And this is a read-only register. Moving a little further, we get into the register descriptions, and these are much more detailed information about each register. And I want to pause right here on control register 1A for the accelerometer. And that was, if you recall, a 20 hexadecimal register address. And like I said before, each register holds one byte of data. And in this case, it's some configuration data or how we want the device to operate. Here in table 1A, it gives you a description of what each bit means. Every byte has eight bits of information um, if you convert that byte to a binary number. So here we can see that in table 18, that these four bytes are all actually part of one configuration setting. This is called ODR, and that has to do with the data rate. And then these other four bytes on the right actually each control one thing. Table 19 here shows us what that is. I'm going to start on the right because this is byte zero. This is byte one, two, three. If you're looking at the whole byte, this is bits four, five, six, and seven. 
But if you look down here, uh, this is actually ODR330, and they're just labeled here just like this. Um, because they're using this to control one thing, they're calling this bit zero of that chunk of data. And they are just appending one item after the other, and they're not necessarily related to each other. So starting on the right, XEN just means for the X enable. Its default value is one. And then you would only really change these if for some reason you really didn't want data for the Z axis or the Y axis or whatever in uh, for your accelerometer. LP enable refers to the low power mode and it's got a default value of zero. So it's not normally in low power mode, um, but that is an option. And that will be described somewhere you might have to search for in another section exactly what low power mode means. This is a little bit juicier, these bits five, six, seven, and eight, which of course um, have the acronym ODR, uh, zero, one, two, and three. And you just have to consider these as a separate piece of information, but, but one piece. And we can look down at table 20. Fortunately, it points us to table 20. And it has a default value of zero, 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 zero which means by default when you turn the device on it is not posting any data it is not updating the registers for the accelerometer so you won't get any information until you change uh, this odr section you can come down to table 20 and choose what's appropriate for you um, one hertz seems awful low to me for an accelerometer but perhaps it's useful for some uh, i normally wouldn't use an accelerometer at less than 10 hertz but even that's pretty low uh, but this is up to you. You can decide what you need. Running it faster than you need um, means that uh, you're just going to waste some energy and it is possible that um, data will be overwritten before you're able to read it. And if you're trying to do some integration and such with the accelerometer data, that could be a problem. So the rule of thumb is to pick the lowest speed that will do the job for you that you can keep up with reading but that is up to you. And what I really just want to point out is that we're going to, uh, for example, if you were to turn this device on and send a read command to read two zero hex, you're going to come back with zero 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 one one one, which of course, if you read that as a decimal is seven, which means you're not getting any data from the registers. So then if you send a write command, to register two zero hex. Let's say you wanted to read the accelerometer 50 times per second, 50 hertz. You would set these first four bits to zero, one, zero, zero. And if you stack that along the rest that you're going to leave the same, you would end up with zero, one, zero, 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 one, 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 which in decimal turns out to 71 or you can write it directly as binary. What's important is that what you write doesn't change 0111 on the unrelated control bits. So with a decimal of 71 written to register one, uh, that should power on the device, but we need to keep looking down at the other control registers to learn about other behaviors. And I'm not gonna go bit by bit through every single one because you'll just have to read the description. Your device is probably going to be different than this exact one. I do want to point out some configuration things in register 23 because it has some specific things that have to be paid attention to. For instance, BDU is just an acronym for block data update, the default value of zero. That means it's going to continuously update the data registers, whether the data has been read or not. Big little Indian data selection, default value of zero. This is important because like I said, the values that you're going to be able to read are 16-bit values, and every register only has eight bits. So choosing big little endian, some devices will allow you to choose whether the lower eight bits are at the lower register address or at the higher register address. You can swap it back and forth. But it's very critical that your software matches what you have selected. Scale selection is important, as is the resolution modes, because both of these things will affect the values that you get and multipliers. Usually when you combine your two bytes 
or even if you're reading one byte values from a device, it's usually not the final number and you have to multiply or divide to get the final value. And finally, we start getting to some data registers. Uh, the status register, if it's important, can tell you if, if data has been overwritten without being read. And most important to me has always been these out registers. This is our high byte and our low byte. And it's important to come way down here and read that the value is expressed in two's complement because it makes a big difference how you convert the information into a decimal. Another very important thing to know um, to read about your device is that if you remember if you remember way back up at the top where the device outputs 16-bit data that doesn't necessarily mean that it is using all 16 bits at least one sensor I've used and it may have been one of these two but I've run into devices that use only 10 or 12 of those 16 bits of data for actual information um, so you're still combining bytes but you have to know that you have to drop some of the bits from the high byte usually. I'll be doing another video shortly after this um, that gets into a little bit more detail about combining high bytes and low bytes and we'll do some examples and talk about that a little bit more in detail. But here you can find you're going to read registers hex 28 and hex 29 and put those two bytes together to get one number that represents your acceleration information. It's expressed in a two's complement, which tells you that it is a signed number uh, because acceleration data can be negative. In order to find the final value, you're going to read these registers, combine the bytes as appropriate. And from there, if we pop back to page nine under sensor characteristics, you're going to find the configuration for the FS bit. And you're going to find what it's set to. And that is going to give you a multiplier that you're going to apply to the combined raw data that you read from the registers and combined. And you apply that multiplier and you end up with the result of this particular unit, which the base unit for acceleration for this device is G's, it's the gravities. And if you find what your FS bit is set to, you can match it up to determine which multiplier to apply to come up with MG. And that is per LSB. LSB stands for least significant bit. And here for the magnetometer, you have uh, quite a few more options rather than two bits for setting the sensitivity. You can set the magnetic gain with three bits. So you have quite a few more options. And notice that uh, the multiplier varies for the X and Y axes for magnetism. You're going to use 670. And for the Z axes, uh, for the very same gain bit setting, 011, your multiplier is 600. And Gauss is the unit of measure they're using for magnetism. These are important to note because other devices I've used um, will use meters per second squared instead of G's. And magnetometers I've used have also used Tesla instead of Gauss. And I think that just about wraps up what I wanted to show you in this video. Don't fret too much. If you still have some questions, pick yourself up a copy of Practical Robotics in C++, where I spend 21 chapters teaching you everything from setting up a computer for robotics, basic electronics for robotics, hardware, building a physical robot, as well as robot control algorithms, autonomous path planning, mapping, computer vision. and everything you need to build a complete autonomous robot with plenty of room to keep growing with you as your skills improve over the years. Specifically in chapter five, we dive in detail into communications with sensors and other devices. So you get some hands-on experience with several I squared C devices and that'll probably really help the lessons in this video and the book really click together so you'll understand how to communicate with any I squared C device, not just the ones we've demoed. I'm Lloyd, author of Practical Robotics in C++. If you need the tutorial on combining uh, and separating bytes from communications operations, 
I'll see you right back here. And thank you guys so much for watching.